My dad loved clocks. Not just clocks. Anything that kept time was fair game. But his house was filled with clocks. Big old grandfather clocks, tiny little cuckoo clocks, even some shiny metal art pieces with the clock faces jutting out at odd angles. The pride of his collection was an antique German wall clock made in the 1870s. It had been his grandfather's, bought off a pair of Russian soldiers during World War II. My dad used to tell me that it had hung on the wall of Heinrich Himmler himself during the war. When dad died, my mom couldn't deal with the hassle of cleaning out all his stuff and putting it into boxes, so it fell to me. Per my father's will, most of his collection was sold off at auction and the money was put in a nest egg to keep my mom comfortable after he was gone. Hundreds of watches, clocks, and a few antique chronometers. Everything was sold off piecemeal. Everything except for that old German clock that he left to me. And his will insisted that I keep it in my possession. I never much cared for clocks. The ticking in dad's office used to drive me insane. And by the time I was a teenager, I refused to so much as wear a watch. The only clocks in my house for my entire ad adult life have been on my phone and computer. I tried to talk mom into keeping the old thing. I told her I didn't feel right taking it when it was all she had left of dad's collection. It didn't work. She insisted that it had been passed down from my great grandfather and I should pass it on to my son someday. I couldn't just tell her that I hated the thing, so I brought it home and set it up in an unused bedroom that I kept telling myself I was going to convert into an office. The first night, I could hear it through the walls, two rooms down, and it was still burrowing its way into my skull and filling my dreams with a sense of urgency and panic. The ticking of a clock always made me feel like time was running out, as if I could sense the end of my life closing in on me. It doesn't make for a restful night. In the morning, I moved it into the garage alongside childhood trophies and the sweater my grandmother sent me for Christmas and headed for work. My head ached and my eyes burned the entire day. I figured I was coming down with something. I ended up knocking off two hours early and heading home. A little sleep would make everything better. The sound of the old German clock greeted me as I walked through the front door. While I was out, someone had sat it up on the counter. At least I assumed someone must have. Even though I live alone except for a great orange cat I rescued from a shelter three years ago, Schrodinger stood on the counter staring at the clock like he was waiting for it to attack. But I was pretty sure he hadn't been the one to move the clock in from the garage. My alarm system keeps a log of every time the code is entered and I checked it to see if my mom had dropped by, unannounced. No one had been in since I said it that morning. Could I have done it? I've never been a morning person. One time, I managed to put my sunglasses in the freezer instead of an ice tray, and didn't notice until I went to make dinner. That was when I did something stupid, something I've come to regret over the last few days. I shrugged it off. The clock went back to its spot in the spare room. The noise followed me throughout the house as I went about my nightly routine. I fell asleep to the sound of the ticking clock and dreamt of screaming and the crunch of bones being ground between the giant clock's ancient brass gears. A nightmare I don't think I've had since I was a kid. When I woke up, the clock seemed impossibly loud and my mouth felt like I had spent the night sucking on cotton balls. I was in a foul mood as I got out of bed, put down Schrodinger's breakfast, and took the clock out to the trash can on the curb. The ticking clock didn't miss a beat as I crammed it into the half-full black trash can, and there was no question in my mind that it ticked louder than it had the day before, and I glanced around my quiet street, hoping that the neighbors didn't hear it. I came home from work that night to find the clock waiting for me on my kitchen counter. Schrodinger's food sat on the floor next to the sink, untouched. The alarm showed nothing. 
No one had been in or out the entire day. I wanted to scream. I wanted to run. I didn't do either. Instead, I called for my cat, that giant ball of fluff who had kept me company from the moment I moved into my own place. I screamed until my throat was hoarse, checked under the bed and in Schrodinger's favorite hiding spot underneath the sink. Finally, after I'd checked everywhere I could think of, I gave up. The old clock ticked away the whole time like the laughter of a mad clockwork man mocking my search. My hands shook as I snatched up the old clock and tucked it under one arm. Three summers ago, I built a fire pit behind my house. A place where I could roast hot dogs and drink a cold beer. It hasn't seen mo half as much as I'd like, but it was the perfect place to do away with the damnable clock. I poured half a can of gasoline on the damn thing before lighting it up. The flames leapt into the air, nearly reached the trees 30 feet above my head. The well-oiled wood crackled and sparked as the edges curled and split. I watched until long after the sunset, and nothing was left but ash. Before I went to bed that night, I searched the house for Schrodinger again, even though part of me knew I wouldn't find him. He never left a speck of food in his bowl. Not even on the rare occasion where I accidentally fed him twice. If he was in the house, his bowl would be clean. I gave up close to midnight and crawled into bed, exhausted and a little heartsick. I woke up just before dawn with the sound of the clock banging in my ears. It was coming from the kitchen. I couldn't bear to face it. I lay in bed listening to the loud tick of the old German clock for hours praying that it was all a terrible dream, unable to get back to sleep. When my alarm went off, I called in and told my boss I was coming down with the flu. The way I'd been the past two days, he didn't seem surprised to hear it. It was the sound of the front door opening that, have, that finally forced me out of bed. Janine, the young woman who worked for the cleaning service I had come in once a week, was surprised to see me home. We'd only met twice before, the first time when I hired the service, then once when the office had been shut down last winter due to some burst pipes. That's new, she said after we'd exchanged pleasantries. What? I asked, still groggy. Sorry, the clock. Right. I forced my eyes towards the old German clock. The clock I only then realized I had hoped was just a symptom of a psychotic break. Janine had ripped the, that delusion away by acknowledging the damn thing. It sat on the kitchen counter where I knew it would be. If a clock were capable of it, it would have been mocking me. I'll be in my room. Just lock up when you leave. I retreated to my room before Janine could respond and stayed there until well into the afternoon. Janine never stopped by to let me know she was going. That night, I moved the clock back to its new home in the spare room. It ticked madly. The metal pendulum, safe behind the unbroken glass that I had watched crack and blacken in a fire. Holding it in my hands, I swear I felt a pulsing warmth beneath the wood, like a black heart pumping warm blood through the mechanical guts of the old timepiece. The weekend came, and I was grateful that no one would want to see me until Monday. My nights were filled with dreams of death and destruction and of an ancient forest wreathed in fog where thin, wasted branches grabbed at me and thorny vines seemed to leap forward of their own accord. I was starting to hear the wind blowing through the forest's ancient gnarled trees even when I was awake. The tick 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 of the clock sounded more like a mad rhythmic pulse with every passing hour. Saturday morning, the police knocked on my door, pulling me out of a hazy nightmare where a ticking forest tried to strangle me with smooth, polished vines. Two plain-clothed detectives stood at the door, and I invited them in wordlessly. My eyes were watering, and I was dressed in pajamas that hadn't been changed since Thursday night. The clock ticked on from the kitchen, the spot it had chosen for itself. The first thing the detectives did was ask if I was okay. I'm fine, just a bit under the weather. C 
Can I help you with something? I answered, not feeling fine at all. We're checking into a missing person, Janine Blakely. According to her employer, she never showed up after rounds on Friday. Your house was on her schedule the day she went missing. I could practically feel the color draining from my face as the detective spoke. I collapsed into a nearby chair, the legs scraping against the floor as I went. The detective watching me with a wary eye, their hands fidgeting dangerously close to the guns at their waists. Missing? Janine is missing? Sir, did you see Mrs. Blakely the night she went missing? Yes, yes, I was home, not feeling well. She came by at her usual time. What time was that? Around 10, I said. The last time she reported in was just before she got here then. Did you see anything suspicious? Notice anyone following her? No, we barely spoke. I stayed in the bedroom while she cleaned up out here. I didn't see anything. Sir, do you mind if we have a look around? The lead detective asked. The way he said it, it was more of a demand than a request. And I had a feeling that refusing him wouldn't buy me much time anyway. Sure, go right ahead. I leaned back in my chair, rubbing at my temples. Three days of constant ticking and erratic, nightmare-filled sleep had brought on a migraine. The detective searched the house while I sat by, answering the occasional question as it came. One of the detectives came back, a small black object in his hands. His eyes focused on me. Sir, do you have a cat? Sitting up, I stared at the detective's find, a small black collar with a red clover-shaped tag on it. I knew the name that was engraved there, remembered the day I bought him his collar, and how much he'd hated it, until finally he'd accepted it with the same mild disinterest he showed everything I forced on him. I did. Where did you find that? Oh, the detective replied and handed the collar to me. Sorry. It was on the floor in the kitchen. You said Mrs. Blakely was here on the day she disappeared? She did her rounds and left? Was it typical for her to leave things like this lying in the floor? I can't say. Like I said, I was sick. I didn't leave my room the entire day, I said. I see, he said as his partner returned from searching the garage. They conferred at a distance while I sat there, holding that small black collar. I ran my fingers over the engraving, Schrodinger, and stared into space as the spoken whispers. In the end, the detectives left with a promise that they'd be in touch. I could have told them that looking for Janine was pointless, that they'd never find a trace of her, but what would have been the point? I'd be arrested as a suspect and eventually let go when they couldn't find a trace of evidence to convict. And all the while that damned clock would tick away. Unable to go back to sleep and desperate for a little peace and quiet for the first time in days, I headed out. My little suburban neighborhood lets out into a rustic 50s style downtown area. A single main street lined with the rows of locally owned shops. Half the shops are closed now. But not too many years ago, it was a place where weekenders would come down, peruse antiques, and enjoy homemade ice cream on hot summer days. It was the easygoing charm of that street that convinced me to buy my house. Walking down those streets and seeing the normalcy of it, I would almost forget what waited for me at home. The collar hung from my fingertips, the light jingle of metal making sure I didn't forget. As I passed by Phil's Emporium, a small dusty store where I'd bought a hand-carved humidor for my dad five years ago. I heard it. Not a loud, jarring sound like the ticking of the old German clock, but the gentle, comforting tick of a well-made Swiss pocket watch sitting behind the glass case next to a modern digital clock. It was a sing-song sound. It was a comforting sound. I found myself lost in it. Entranced with and comforted by the sound of a clock for the first time in my life. I bought it, immediately, and carried it home to me, 
to sit next to the old German clock. As quiet as it was, that ticking watch seemed to quiet the old clock, adding a musical backdrop to the old monstrosity that made it less threatening. That night, I slept a little easier. The nightmares were still there, but distant. That was six months ago. They never found Janine, and the detectives never got in touch. I never found Schrodinger, and I don't think I'll ever replace him. I've bought more clocks in the time, not just clocks. Anything that keeps time is fair game. But I have an entire room filled with clocks. Antique clocks, clocks built into coffee tables, big grandfather clocks, and tiny 3D printed clocks from a specialty shop in Austin. And at the very center of it all, ticking away quietly amongst a hundred other noisy clocks, is an old German wall clock, the pride and joy of my collection. <laughs>